I'd like to uh, begin my sermon today with a few quotes from uh, a survey that was completed by young adults last year before the uh, General Conference of Elders. And uh, so I've had this in, uh, get these quotes for quite a while, and so I meant to use them, and so today I'll, I'll put them to, to work. And uh, I'm going to begin with some questions and some responses. First of all, it says, how can the church better serve young adults? The response was, I believe that the young adults in our church need to be provided an opportunity to be held more accountable for the day-to-day -day operations, growth, and well-being of the church when there are no expectations of us to chip in or if we are per periodically denied an opportunity to serve when we offer, it can be discouraging and make us feel as though our efforts or input is not needed. Second question, in what specific areas is the church doing reasonably well in serving young adults and making them feel a part of the church as a whole? The response, involving young adults at camp activities, winter family weekends, and other activities that bring us all together uh, with not only people our age, but younger and older generations of, the, of church members. And finally, the final question and response is, in what specific areas is the church not doing well in serving young adults and making them feel a part of their local congregation? I think it would be great if the young adults could be brought in under the wing of some of the deacons and elders to assist with some of the behind the scene activities that take place in order to keep the church operating smoothly every Sabbath. There are other activities that take place, elders anointing an ill member that I have never personally observed or am not very familiar with. If I ever am asked to be an elder in the church someday, it would be great to already have a, have a familiarity with it. Just so you know, when I was ordained an elder, nobody explained to me what, it, what an anointing, what you were to do when you anointed somebody. So when I started, I didn't know. So I just stood there and watched the other guys, what they did, and said, okay, that's the model, and that's what I try, uh, tried to do from there on out. It's, uh, it goes on to say there are... Um, uh, the, final, and the final comment here is allowing them more opportunities to participate in church, for example, giving the prayers. So the comments that were made here seem to indicate a desire to become more involved in the church. And as we saw from my previous sermon, we do need more involvement in the church in order to fill the gaps that are going to appear and uh, to carry on the responsibilities and duties that are found in a local congregation. Uh, we've looked at that particular subject. We see that uh, we are an aging uh, group of people for the most part, and many of the people who have been the longtime servants, they are aging, and, and in 10 years, the, the church will be a very different place. And uh, so we have a challenge of replacing those who are those servants and helping people to grow and mature and take on those responsibilities. So the question that went through my, my mind that I thought I would answer today is this. So how does a person become involved in the church and begin to make a greater contribution to a local congregation? In other words, how does one, one mature in the faith in order to become a, a replacement for those who are already servants in the church? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and see what the scriptures have to tell us about that particular subject. And again, we're going to take a historical perspective. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the church and how it began, uh, and that began on Pentecost, and see how the church expanded uh, beyond that first Pentecost. And the model that we find there is the model that we've always followed and will continue to follow as far as the church is concerned. So we begin with the church in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, thou, you know, thousands and thousands of <coughs> people that were God's people gathered on in Jerusalem at the temple. And a, a portion of those people had been asked by Jesus Christ to be there. He told them to be at the temple on the day of Pentecost. And so they were gathered there in the temple in, on 30, in 31 AD. And uh, so what happened on that day was God's spirit was poured out on that portion of the people there. A lot of people saw the wind, heard the wind blowing and saw what was taking place and it was truly a miracle. But only a portion of the people gathered there received God's spirit. And uh, so God's spirit was poured out on them. The first uh, sermon was given 
and uh, people were pricked in their hearts and they responded. And let's begin in Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 40. So God's spirit has been poured out upon the people at this point and the church is off and running as Christ wanted it to be. Acts chapter 2 verse 40. It says, and with many other words he testified. So uh, Simon Peter has given the first inspired sermon of the New Testament church. He's uh, uh, given, he's exhorted them and uh, spoken to them with many other words. And he said, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who, who believed were together and had all things in common. So uh, the people that had traveled from distant locations, they all stayed on in Jerusalem. And they needed places to stay, and they needed to be, to be fed and to be taken care of. So provision was made by those people who lived in Jerusalem to take care of those who were, had come from distant locations in order to be there on the Feast of Pentecost. So all of the church was unfolding, and they were learning, and they were growing, and they were all working together in a committed way at this particular point in time. Now all who believed we were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as, all as anyone had need. So they didn't all take a vow of poverty, sell their homes, and, uh, and basically everybody was destitute from that point forward. But they, they lived there, they had uh, certain possessions that they could uh, sell and help to help those other people that were there and uh, learning and growing along with them. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So God called, God added people to the church. That is God's doing, not people's doing. That was not done because the, Peter was quite an eloquent speaker. It had nothing to do with that. Peter expounded the truth. He was inspired by God's spirit, but God moved people to hear what he had to say and to respond to it and become a part of the church. So as you think about the church at that particular time, there was only one church in the entirety of the earth, only one church, and it was meeting in Jerusalem. You didn't have churches all over the Roman Empire or all around the earth. There was one church as it began. And as you think about the parable of the leaven, it began small and it expanded from there. And you, other parables that talk about things beginning in small uh, and, and expanding from there. And that's how God has tended to work. It starts small and it grows large. Let's go over to Acts chapter, 40, uh, chapter 4 and look at verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. So the church is growing and, uh, and people are uh, in harmony and unity here. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon all. So God used the apostles, and the apostles were able to do great miracles. They were able to do things that have, I've not seen happen in my time. Might they happen in the future? Possibly. But they've not happened in my lifetime. Have miracles been done? Yes. But nothing that was that dramatic that other people would really notice it and, uh, and uh, rejoice and uh, be moved as they were here in, in this uh, very special time in the church. So, um, verse 34, nor was there, there, was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought that, the proceeds of the things that, they were, that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the feet of the apostles. So you have this 
unity and this harmony and this, this esprit de corps that existed in the church at that time. And, uh, and it describes a, an individual who was going to go on to be an apostle. His name was Barnabas. And uh, he was a very giving and outgoing person. And he was known as the son of encouragement. Now, why would they give him that name? Why would they give him the name son of encouragement? It's because the people who gave him that name knew him. And knew that the way that he was, he was an encourager. He was a great asset to the church. And they could see this by what he displayed in the congregation. In the way that he served the congregation. And he was named what he was, an encourager. Let's go to chapter 5, verse 12. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. So there were people that had become a part of the church, and there were other people that saw what was going on here, and they thought highly of it, but they weren't willing to take that step and become a part of the church. But they thought highly of the people and what was going on. Verse 14, and believers were increasingly added to the, the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might uh, fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So... Great and wonderful things were being done in the church at this time. The church is growing. Their, their miracles are being accomplished. It was truly a very special time in this one church in Jerusalem that had grown large. Now let's go to Acts chapter 6. Now this is just basically talking about what was going on in the church at this time. But we see something important take place in Acts chapter 6 that gives us some indication about how somebody becomes a servant in the church who moves on to begin to, give a, to contribute to the congregation. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. It says, Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. So you had those who were native Judeans who lived in Jerusalem and who were part of that particular land. And you had the Hellenists. They were Jews from other parts of the empire. They didn't live in Jerusalem. So they were visitors. They had, they had stayed on there after Pentecost because they saw something dramatic was taking place. And what was happening is, is those who were of the city of Jerusalem and of Judea, they were being given preeminence in how they were being taken care of. It may have not been knowingly done, there may not have been prejudice there, but the Hellenists were noting, we're not really getting a fair deal here. So they began to complain. So it said, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So then it says the 12, that is the apostles, summoned the multitude of disciples uh, and, uh, and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So we have a spiritual responsibility to the people, to the people of this congregation. And our time is being consumed by trying to take care of all the needs of both the Hebrews and the Hellenists. And we're not able to keep up with all of it. So they're explaining this to the congregation. Verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So they asked the congregation, they said, You pick seven men who can take care of these responsibilities. You pick them. And the reason they asked them to pick them is because the congregation knew who was of good reputation in the congregation. They knew in the congregation who was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, how did they know they were full of the Holy Spirit? Did they glow? Or what was it that helped them to be able to understand that they were full of the Holy Spirit? It was by the fruit that they bore in the congregation. You see, the fruits of love, joy, peace, and all of those qualities, they're fruit that others can pick. And these men 
displayed that. And it was obvious to the congregation, men of, who had the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And he said, these men, because of the quality of their character, we will appoint them over these responsibilities. And they said in verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the sayings pleased the whole multitude, and they chose seven men, and they're all listed there for us, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So they set them apart for God's purpose to serve as deacons in the church. And then it says in verse 7, Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we can see that the church was organized. There were apostles, and they sought to uh, ordain other men to help in the the service of the church. There was an organization here. It was not just fly by night. So there was an organization in the congregation They ordained these men, and uh, they began to serve the congregation as deacons. And um, let's go down to verse 8, and it talks about one of the deacons who was ordained. His name was Stephen. He was full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So the church is moving forward. They're preaching the gospel, and Stephen was moved to preach the gospel as well, to share the truth with others. So he comes into contact with the people of this particular synagogue, and one of the people who was of this synagogue was the Apostle Paul. He was from Cilicia, and he was there in Jerusalem, and he attended this synagogue, and they were disputing with Stephen. And uh, Stephen was filled with wisdom, and able to expound the truth to them. And as it says in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. But they didn't like what he had to say, and they sought his downfall. And um, they, they could not resist his arguments, and uh, they sought to do him in. So then, as a, as a result of Stephen's uh, preaching and uh, the unhappiness that these people had with him, uh, Stephen is martyred. And uh, this was just the beginning of challenges for the church. Let's go to chapter 8. So Stephen is stoned to death. And it says in chapter 8, verse 1, Now Saul was consenting to his death. Saul stood there. He watched what took place. They laid their garments down at his feet. And the people went on to stone Stephen. He saw this. He was consenting to it. He thought it was the best thing to happen to the, for the people of God at that particular time. And as you look at the Apostle Paul, he was an enemy of the church and of Jesus Christ. So um, it's, Saul consented, was consenting to this and going on in verse, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So persecution set in and the church is scattered. So the church probably thought, well, we're going to go on like this forever. That wasn't God's intention. So he allowed Stephen to be martyred and he allowed the church to be scattered. So people went out from there. And, uh, you know, you either got out of town or you may have uh, suffered the same fate as Stephen. So people scattered out from Jerusalem. It says um, in verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So as you look at the one who became the Apostle Paul, or as Saul as he was known at this particular time, he was an enemy of the church. He came after the church members and sought to get them to recant, to put pressure upon them, to disavow an allegiance to Jesus Christ. Verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the gospel. So they knew the truths that they had heard. They had seen the miracles in the city of Jerusalem. They had seen how God had worked through the apostles, and they went out, and they shared that truth with other people in the places where they went. They went back to the synagogues, and they shared what their experience had been in Jerusalem. 
So the church was uh, scattered at this particular point. The church in Jerusalem still met, but it wasn't quite as big of a group as it, yet, as it was at one time. And as you think about it, where did, these, the, did the people go? You realize that there were people from all over the world in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And a number of them had stayed. And you go back and you look at Acts chapter 2, and it talks about the places these people were from. And yes, people went back to the places that were closer to Jerusalem. But Acts chapter 2 tells us that uh, people were from all over the world. As it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And how is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, you know, out by the... Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and to, and to the east of there you had Jews had come to Jerusalem. And Elamites, who were all out, also out there as, as well. Those dwelling in Mesopotamia around the area of Babylon. Judea and Cappadocia. That's, Cappadocia is one of the places you can enjoy if you go on the Turkey tour this year. Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. This all in what is modern day Turkey. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the ports of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselyte, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues. And these people all began going back to where they were from. They began going back to where they were from. So the churches scattered and they, they went out to various parts of the world and they were that little seed by which a congregation could be raised. And uh, let's look at one of the churches where the church expanded to, and that's in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. So anyway, we have here, we don't want to go there, we want to go to um, a congregation that was established in verse 4. So they went to Samaria, which is a little bit north of Jerusalem. It used to be the capital of uh, ancient Israel. Verse 4 says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Philip, who is a deacon, went to that city and began preaching. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city. So a, they began to, Philip went to the city of Samaria and began to preach there and uh, a congregation was raised up there. But something interesting happens here in this particular city. Verse 9 says, But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria. So he was a powerful and influential man, but he was a sorcerer. He was a sorcerer, claiming that he was someone great. I am a great man, and look at what I can do. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And he did nothing to disavow that. His whole way of impressing them was to impress upon him, them that he was the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with, all, with his sorceries for a long time. But with Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So Philip was baptizing, then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So Simon the sorcerer, Simon Magus, as he's also called, watched all this taking place and like a predator seeing an opportunity, hey, look at what this guy can do. I want to do that because I will be even more impressive to people. It's a way for me to have power and to make money. And uh, so he was, interestingly, he was baptized. So uh, uh, obviously he professed to believe what Pete, uh, Philip was teaching and he was baptized. So that's not the end of the story. Verse, so he, Philip baptized them, but he, could, he did not have the power to, to lay hands on them so that they could receive the Spirit of God. 
Verse 14, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard the, that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had, it, had fall, had, for as yet it had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Hey, let me buy that power from you. I don't know how you do it, but I, I want some of that. Let me, let me pay you money and, you can give, and I can have the same power. And give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And how do you think he would... Uh, Put that to use. He'd probably say, well, for a little bit of money here, we can take care of you. That was his plan. This is going to be a great money maker. So, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. And what does he tell him to do? He says, repent. Repent. Therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So Simon was just in this for the money and the power and the prestige that he could have. And God helped Peter to recognize where this man was coming from. And he did not, he did not lay hands on him. He did not allow, you know, God's spirit uh, was not poured out on him. And, uh, but Simon went on to use uh, what he had learned and to put it to work and to uh, be instrumental in the uh, creation of a false Christianity. The church also spread to Damascus and Paul re received uh, authorization from the high priest to go to Damascus and to uh, begin to attack the Christians there. And uh, on his way to Damascus, as we learn in Acts chapter 9, Christ confronted the Apostle Paul and uh, ask him, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? And uh, so he, Paul was uh, blinded, and Paul was, uh, went through a process there and, uh, was and chose to follow God. He realized something powerful had come into contact with him, and that, that, that what had come into contact with him identified himself as Jesus Christ, the one that Paul was attacking. And Paul very quickly turned from that path of being an enemy of the church to being one of the greatest servants of the church ever. But you know, when he turns on a dime like that, most people aren't going to buy it. Hey, this is probably just a ruse to find out who the Christians are, and then we're all going to be carted, either killed or carted off to prison or whatever. So people didn't trust Paul right away. They had their doubts, doubts about him. But, uh, and as Paul goes, begin, you know, Paul was a zealous individual. So he was attacking the church, and then he turns on a dime, and he becomes God's servant, and he's sharing the gospel with people, offending them, and stirring up trouble. And eventually, uh, you know, he, was doing, he had to escape Damascus. He went to Jerusalem and was stirring up trouble in Jerusalem. And finally they said, you know what? You need a little seasoning. Maybe you need to go back home to Tarsus, and learn some things where you maybe will be wiser in the future. But it seems where as you look at Paul's experience and you look at his journeys, you find that Paul, wherever he went, almost always there's upheaval. There's rioting. Uh, there's, uh, he's arrested. You know, all kinds of things happened. And it was almost always, you know, Paul's in the thick of it. So he was a, a very interesting individual, uh, but zealous, most zealous for God. Let's just look at one, verse, one more verse here in chapter, thir, uh, chapter 9, verse 31. So there's all this persecution. Paul changes his direction. He repents and he begins to serve Christ. And what happens? It says in verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So the church was, there. God can cause peace or he can cause it to be a time of tribulation and upheaval. 
God has that power and God is in control of what goes on. So the church, after Paul turned from being a persecutor of the church, uh, the church was at peace and the church began to, began to grow. Let's go to chapter 11 of Acts and look at verse, and, uh, look at verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So, um, and uh, Barnabas re-enters the story here, Acts chapter uh, 11, verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. So they, they would go to the synagogue and they would preach the gospel there. And, uh, and, uh, this was, and the, so the church is uh, spreading out further. Verse 20, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had uh, come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So we've heard that the church is growing in Antioch. God is blessing the, the, us with growth there. And so Barnabas went up there to find out what was going on. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them. That shouldn't be surprising. That's the way Barnabas was. Encourage them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Paul, uh, Barnabas saw what was happening there, so what did he do? He said, I need help. I need somebody to help me. So he said, I you know, asked Paul to go to Tarsus. So he went up to Tarsus and uh, began looking around for Paul. He finally found him and brought him back to help him at, at Antioch. He brought him back and they began to work together there. And um, so the church is prospering in Antioch and, and Barnabas and Saul, they uh, come back and uh, begin to continue the work there. In time, uh, a famine bro was, uh, broke out in the, in the land of Judea and around that area. So the, the people were in Antioch uh, sent a relief package for the brethren dwelling in Judea, and uh, they entrusted Barnabas and Saul with that package. So they went down there and delivered the package, and they came back and uh, brought uh, Mark, uh, the, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. He came back and was going to be assisting them. Now let's go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there was, were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Uh, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So they, they recognized that Barnabas and Saul were teachers and effective teachers and effective servants. And God helped them to see that it would be good if these men went out and further propagated the gospel. So they went out and, uh, and carried the message further afield a, a and uh, shared it with others. And um, so they sent Barnabas and Saul out and uh, they first went to Cyprus. Then they went up to Asia Minor. They preached the gospel first in the synagogues and then to the Gentiles. So they came to recognize they would go to the synagogue, but not everybody welcomed them with open arms. In fact, a sizable portion of them were hostile. So eventually they saw, well, they aren't willing to listen. Then we'll go to the Gentiles and we'll share the gospel with them. So they, moved, they went from Cyprus up to Asia Minor and uh, went up to the middle of Asia Minor in the area that we would know as Gaul. Uh, that's the, the area to which the book of Galatians was addressed. And they began preaching in a place called Antioch in Pisidia. Let's go to Acts chapter 13, continue in Acts chapter 13, and begin in verse 42. Acts chapter 13, verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that they, these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes 
They were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They, blaspheming. they opposed things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was not necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commended us. So they sought to share the gospel with them. They were rejected, so they went to those who would listen. So they did their work in the... Antioch and Pisidia, verse 48, it says, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. So they shared the gospel, and it was spread throughout the region. They later on went to Iconium. It's found in chapter 14, verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. And again, the, the Jews that were antagonistic, they stirred up everything and, uh, and the people were um, divided. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like you have uh, Paul and Barnabas' uh, Barnabas's supporters and their antagonists, and they're kind of lined up there, you know, less filling, tastes great. You know, they're kind of back and forth on this, and uh, people were uh, unhappy with some are happy and some aren't. But to me, it's, it's indicative of the way things were at that particular time because when Paul uh, went into the one city there in Ephesus and preached the gospel, this rioting breaks out, and they're, they're all day screaming, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Now, I couldn't see myself screaming that all day long, but they spent quite a bit of time doing that, so that was common to that particular time. I don't think any of us would do it. We'd say, Great is Diana of the Ephesians a few times, and then, that's okay, we're out of here, because we're not going to keep doing this all day long, but it was a different world back then, and obviously they were cheering on their particular goddess. Then he, they go on to Derby and Lystra, and uh, in, in this particular case, they were, uh, uh, you know, Paul was stoned. Amazingly, he gets back up, goes right back into the city. I wouldn't have done that. I would have said, hey, they're not, I'm not popular here. I'm moving on to a different place. But Paul was not to be deterred. So they, they continued their work there, and let's go down to chapter 14 of Acts, verse 21. It says, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders, so they had been there long enough to where they could detect that there were men who could be overseers of the congregation. And they appointed overseers to watch over and care for the congregation. So they appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they had probably explained some things to them. They had taught them some things to them. But they didn't spend years there. But they did the best that they could. And it was kind of like our situation today where we don't have people to just who are well-trained and experienced to put in the place. You've got to try to do some training, and you've got to put people in place in order to do the work. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and they continued to preach there. Uh, then they went back to Antioch, and uh, when they got back to Antioch, uh, they had a situation occur where uh, people who believed that the only way that you could be saved was if you were circumcised, showed up in the city of Antioch, and they began to say that very, uh, preach that message. And you had Gentiles in the congregation there. They hadn't been circumcised. They hadn't been circumcised. They were, and Paul and Barnabas, their experiences had been, we have seen people converted. God's Spirit being given to them and them beginning to bear the fruits of the Spirit. And when they were Gentiles, they were not circumcised. We can, could see that it's not necessary to be circumcised in order to be saved. And so a big argument broke out between the, Paul and Barnabas and uh, these uh, preachers that had come up from Jerusalem. And uh, so they, the congregation said, you know what, we need to resolve this. So we're going to send you down to Jerusalem to the apostles. So we're going to send you down to the apostles and we're going to get this worked out. Chapter, that's, that's in Acts chapter 15, verse 6. 
And, uh, and it says in verse 6 there, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. The, the congregation in Antioch didn't figure this out. The elders and leaders in the church figured this out. And then it became the standard for the entire church. So um, they resolved the issue. The issue was not whether you should keep the law or not. The issue was whether you should be needed to be circumcised in order to receive salvation. And that's incorrect. Paul then ventures forth on a second missionary vi vi uh, vi journey to visit the churches. And, uh, and uh, you know, as you look at that second uh, journey, uh, Mark had failed on the first journey. Basically, he had said, I've had enough, I'm going home. So when the second journey is about to unfold, Barnabas said, let's take Mark. And Paul said, no way. This guy bailed out on us on the first journey. We don't want this guy with us. He's going to bail out on us again. So he, he, no way he was taking Mark. So Barnabas and Paul said, we'll part our ways. We'll still do the work, but we're not going to work together. And Paul took Silas with him and went on uh, went about strengthening the churches, uh, went through C Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And let's go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. So we've already seen that Paul and Barnabas had gone to Lystra and Derby, and uh, they went back to Lystra and Derby into that area. And we find out something interesting here about somebody who's grown and matured and showed themselves ready to be of greater service to the church. Acts chapter 16, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, and the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Now, how could that happen? How could they come to be able to assess him in that way? He never went to church. He was never around. They just guessed that he had good qualities. No. They interacted with him. They knew who he was. They could assess him. They could see the traits that were on display in this man's life. Verse 3, Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews. So it was, in one sense, it wasn't necessary for him to be circumcised, but for the greater service of the people of God, then it was good that he be circumcised so there would be no question when they interacted with the Jews. So, um, and as they, they went through the cities, they delivered to them decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So the church grew and Timothy became a part of that work. The congregations were established, elders and deacons and deaconesses, and others were appointed to care for the churches and the churches were organized in order that the people could best be served. And the people that were chosen were those people who bore the fruits of the Spirit. People in whom they could see wisdom and a, a willing and servant-like heart to help and serve the congregations. Paul, having gained experience in establishing congregations, uh, imparted his knowledge to two men, Timothy and Titus. So let's take, go to 1 Timothy here and look at a few things that Paul had to say to the churches. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's look at verse 3. And it's interesting to me, one of the first things that Paul has to say here to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says here, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Paul obviously, in Ephesus, had the challenge of people preaching other doctrines. We're not people talking about people talking about how great is Diana. We're talking about people in the church preaching doctrines opposite from what Paul had taught. So they're teaching other things. And they're creating confusion in the congregation. And Paul says, I'm going on to Macedonia. You stay here and you address this. So, you know, doctrine is not just a matter of opinion. Doctrine are the beliefs and truths that are found in the Bible. 
They're not just opinions, because if it's all opinion, then we can all do whatever we want. And that's not the case at all. So there were true doctrines. The people that Timothy was dealing with had to address the false notions that they were stirring up in the congregation. And it's the, the, almost the first thing he says to Timothy. He says in verse 4, Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. And if you want to have problems in your church, have a variety of doctrines being preached. Just think back to 1995 and what fun that was. That's what we had, people teaching other doctrines and creating confusion in the church. And you had people in that corner believing this and this corner believing something else. And it was an ugly, ugly time in the church of God. But, that, but it does happen, and it was happening here. They, and so Paul had to address it. Timothy had to address it. So, you know, we have a certain, you know, we have fundamentals of belief. And we believe in those things. And for someone to go through the congregation preaching something that varies from that, that's, that's the road to destruction of the congregation. So if there's anything that I don't believe, then you know what my job is to do? Keep it to myself. It's not something I should share with you. And I should try to prove what is right and true. And if I've got, if I can't understand it or figure it out, I can talk to people that are smarter than I am and try to figure it out that way. But my, my responsibility and the responsibility of leaders in the church is to hold fast to the truth and to make sure that they, that's all they impart to the congregation because they can do great damage otherwise. So you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're not going to read through chapter 3, and it gives us criteria for someone that you would select as an elder, criteria for someone that you would select as a deacon. And it also uh, mentions why, you know, wives there, and, and those women were deaconesses in the church. You can go through and you can look at the wording there, and uh, there were deaconesses that were in the church at that particular time. And it tells you the criteria by which you would judge somebody to take on this responsibility. And what's, it's interesting to say, interesting to note here in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. It is not wrong to want to be a servant in the church. It is not wrong to want to be a deacon or a deaconess or, a, or an elder. But why do you want to be one? Do you want to be one because it's going to put you in an exalted status among the rest of the brethren? If that's your approach, you've missed the whole point. <laughs> you don't get it. Being an elder or deacon isn't to make you preeminent over the congregation. You see, Christ emptied himself of being God and came to the earth and served all of us. That's the example. That is the model. And it means that all of us are to empty ourselves of whoever and whatever we are to serve one another, to serve the congregation, to serve, you know, and, some, and you know what? Some of us aren't easy to deal with. But he didn't say it's going to be easy. We have to do it. We have to serve one another. So if you would like to be, serve in such a position, even if it's not an ordained position, then you know what you do? The first and foremost thing you do is ask God that if it is his will that he would use you as was best serve the people of God. You let God open the door for you. Now, if there's an opportunity, for instance, you can volunteer for something, you don't need to wait for a vision from God. You can volunteer, say, you know what, I'm willing to do that. And you can step up and you can help out. But it's a matter of giving of yourself in order that the congregation can be benefited. As he goes on here in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's go down to verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. He says here, let no one despise your youth. So Timothy was a, young man, a younger man. He says, let no one despise your youth. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't serve. But there were people that were giving him trouble because he was young. 
But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. I'll tell you my, my story. I went to talk to a, an individual who was prominent in the church and talked to him about serving in the ministry. And his point was, nice try, but we can't use you. He said, you're too young, your voice is weak, and you're too baby-faced. You're not, you're not tall enough. And I'm like, tall enough? I was just, you know, so anyway, I listened to all of this and I kind of, you know, how you're kind of walking out of there with your head down and everything. But, you know, I thought, wait a minute. If God can use me, then God will make that decision. So you keep on going down the road and you do your best to be of service to the church. But that, that wasn't the most encouraging day, <laughs> but it was probably good for me uh, to realize, you know, I'm not God's gift to anything. But, you know, God can use people who are willing to submit to him and do his will. And great things can be accomplished in those people's lives as they're willing to serve. And, you know, we're not all, we're not all necessarily going to be the people that are the cream of the crop and we're going to automatically rise to the top. So what? Do you want to be the top? Or do you want to be a servant of God? So you have to give as, you know, use your talents and abilities to help in whatever way that you can and just see how it works out. So, so don't despise him, but be an example. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you this, if you aren't the biggest or the best or the brightest or most charismatic, but you know, as you are like what he described here, to be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, if you're that kind of a person, you don't think that God's going to use you? And you don't think that people will note that? I think they will. Till I, and he says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that, is in, that was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. And he says, take heed to doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You're going to help the people of God. So he tells the, Timothy to guard the faith, to hold fast. And let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So Paul, and this is his final epistle. His life is coming to a close. He knows that uh, he doesn't have long to live. And in verse uh, 1 he says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he said, I receive the truth from Jesus Christ. Christ and Paul interacted directly with Jesus Christ. And Christ taught him certain things that he passed along to the church. And Paul was faithful in passing along that information to the church. And he says, Timothy, you're going to carry on after I'm gone. And your responsibility is to take the truths that I have shared with you and share them with God's people. And this is, that's not a new concept. That's the same concept that's been a part of the church forever. And it's the concept that's going to help the church to be successful. So what I was taught, it's my responsibility to teach you. So I was taught certain things and I've been blessed to be, have been taught those things, and they've been a blessing to my life, and my responsibility is to teach them to you and to teach them others who will carry on the legacy after I'm dead and gone. That's what you want, is to make sure that the truth is imparted to others who will carry on that truth. Let's go to look at one final scripture here in this regard to Titus and Timothy. Titus chapter 1. Verse 5. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. And uh, Titus is in Crete, and they're having trouble in Crete, and Titus is going to be the one that's going to have to deal with it. 
Titus chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So there were things lacking in the church. And Titus' responsibility were to restore those things and to establish the things that were lacking. He says in verse 6, If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, and he goes on and talks about uh, these qualities, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. And he talks about a, uh, a, uh, an elder and the responsibility to be an overseer in the church. And uh, he says in verse 9, Holding fast the faithful word as has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So there were problems in the church, and his, his, Titus's responsibility was to go into those churches and help those churches and uh, help them to see the truth and to practice the truth. So as you think about the question, how do we come to serve in the church, we can see that there's a clear criteria applied to those who want to serve, especially in an ordained office. This isn't something new. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 18, and it talks about the choosing of men who would serve as captains of hundreds and fifties and tens. And they had to have the qualities that we see in the New Testament. They were wise, they were faithful, they were just, they had proven these things. These are the men that you would choose, and that's what we continue to do. And one doesn't assume responsibility without some scrutiny. You know, I mean, the most obvious thing is, are you here regularly at church? You know, <laughs> if you're not here regularly, we're probably not going to use you, especially in getting up in front of the congregation. And um, there's some scrutiny. And uh, like it, we're told in Matthew 7, verses 16 and 20, it says, by their fruits you shall know them. So we don't know what your fruits are the first day you're here. You know, we have, to, we have to watch you, and we have to say, okay, what's he doing? What is she doing? And, and be able to note those qualities that individuals dis, are displaying. And as you watch, you see what they're doing. And as they, they show themselves to be faithful, then you can give them more responsibility if they, they want to take that on. Another principle is this. Once you've proven yourself faithful in small things, then you can take on greater responsibilities. You know, that's what's uh, laid out in the parable of the talents, where Christ says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. So when you're given the opportunity to be a greeter at the door, are you here? When you're scheduled, do you show? And then, do you enthusiastically do your job? Or you're, you signed up to help out in the kitchen? Do you actually show up? And do you do your job? Those are minor, those are minor things, but they're important things. And as you have a job, you do your job, and you do it responsibly, then people note it, and they say, you know, this person's proven themselves very capable, and we can use them in a greater way if they would like to serve. Those wishing to serve must believe and practice the truths found in the scriptures. You, you have to be known for being faithful. You know the scriptures, you practice the scriptures. And it tells us in Hebrews 10, it says, Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. So there were people that didn't come to church, or just sporadically. And... Uh, you know, we live in an era where that's very common. And, uh, you know, if you happen to be a person who doesn't want to be here every week, you don't have to be here every week, and we're not going to, that's not going to be an issue. But if you want to serve in a greater way, then you're going to have to be here. Because if you're just here every once in a while, and you're not reliable, you don't have to be as long as you're not causing any other problems. But if you're not reliable, then how can we count on you? You know, if we make you the person who opens the door to the church, and you maybe show up and maybe you don't, if we're all standing outside, we're like, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, so, you know, maybe we should, uh, you know, have three people that kind of show up uh, the first there to open the door. You have to be reliable. 
And if you're, you know, if you're just going from church to church and place to place, that's okay. But basically, you're a visitor. You are a visitor. And you know what the church needs is, and is something that is lacking in the church today is called loyalty. There's no loyalty. There's no loyalty. I don't need to be there. I'll go wherever I want and do whatever I want to do. But explain to me how a church is going to grow and prosper if we're not loyal to one another. Any husband or wife, does loyalty matter to you? Well, I'm seeing a little of this on the side and all that. Are you going to accept that? Your congregate, the people, we never chose each other. But you know, we're here together, and the question is, can we make this work? And loyalty is a part of it. Loyalty is an important part of it. See, and you know, as the, the verse there talks about forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, is it important you show up? The reason is because you provoke each other to love and good works. And if you don't know the brethren, you don't know each other, you're not there for each other, then how are you going to do that? You can't provoke people. Well, you might provoke them, but you're not going to provoke them to love and good works unless you're there. And they know, and by the fact that you are there week in and week out, and you're doing the service of the church, they know you care. They know. And as a result of that, the church is encouraged and grows and prospers. There are certain jobs for which we can volunteer, and volunteer to help is where it begins. And, uh, and so, you know, there is opportunity. Take advantage of it. There are other jobs for which you must be chosen based on your fruits. You know, so we, you know, we try to look at your fruits, you know, and, and, and as a result of your fruits add you to the... Uh, the opening and closing prayer list, uh, sermonettes, speaking, song leading. And um, we must see fruits before putting someone up before the congregation because you're in a, in a prominent leadership role. And, and it's an important thing. All of those whom God has called, br brought to repentance, and have received the down payment on salvation, the Holy Spirit, have the opportunity to bear fruit and to become servants in the church. And the church needs such servants. The question that we all have to ask ourselves is, will we yield to God in, in order that we can bear fruits in his service? Will we yield to God and bear fruits in his service? If so, then, if we are yielding ourselves in that way, then we will bear fruits and we will be given opportunities to serve in the congregation. And you may say, well, nobody notices me. Nobody cares that I'm even at church. I'm like invisible. My answer to that is, so what? And I say that because of this. Because there is, if you have a relationship with God in heaven, you talk to him regularly, you study your Bible, you're seeking to practice the truth. He tells us in Psalm 75, he says, that exaltation doesn't come from the east, it doesn't come from the west, it doesn't come from the south. Where does it come from? It comes from the north where God dwells. Exaltation is not something that comes from men. It comes from God. And God allows us to be exalted at the right time and the right place. And in the right way. And as we yield to God and we can go to God and say, you know, I would like to be of greater service to the church. If you can use me, please use me. That's a wonderful prayer. But it may not be the next week that you're going to be giving a sermon or any of that kind of thing. But if you go to God and you ask God to intervene in your life and work in your life, he will. And trust me, you will be exalted in due time. So we need those who can serve, those who can help the church to continue on. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing that we're involved here, but our willingness to sacrifice and give is paramount in that. So hopefully this gives you some idea about how you can become more fully involved in the church, and I hope it will spur you to seek your relationship with God in order that that can be accomplished.